A big warm welcome to you this morning. Thanks very much for spending your morning with us. Due to popular demand, we've decided to do a third edition of Wrapping the Wrap. We thought we were very clever with that, um, with that uh, title. We hope that you find it useful and helpful. Um, and I'm just going to do our regular introduction and then introduce you to our speakers. So you know your team, Dr. Higginbottom, very grateful to him. Uh, it's, this work is really his brainchild. To Jordan Clark for keeping us uh, running smoothly technology-wise. Manny is uh, Manny Ibob is here in the room with us and without her help uh, with technology in the background, silently just keeping us all organized, bless her heart, she is here with us today. That's Manny. And Jen, you'll hear from a little bit later in the session. And Regina, you know myself. So you know that um, we are we were initially funded by the Ministry of Health and uh, we are so very grateful to all of our participants and our speakers. Without you, our participants, and without our speakers who really do this off the side of our desk and really um, with no remuneration, we are just so very grateful to them because we could not do this work without them. So a big shout out to our presenters, a big thanks to the Ministry of Health, and in particular, uh, thanks to the Ministry of Advanced Education, who's afforded us uh, a little bit of money to do this series. And Jen, I see is in the room. A warm welcome to you, Jen. Thank you very much. Maybe have yourself a cup of tea, glass of water, and and um, um, just um, settle yourself down there. So anyways, and that's really great that you're here with us. Um, of Douglas College, as Douglas College staff, we wish to acknowledge the Coquitlam and Kikwat First Nations, as well as all Coast Salish peoples on whose traditional and unceded territory we live, learn, play and work. And I love that we have the idea of play in there, um, but just to give an acknowledgement uh, to our First Peoples. Please do let us know how we're doing. Uh, from the last session, we just had two pieces of feedback. And honestly, we really need your feedback to be able to uh, make improvements, to craft our ideas, to be able to speak to our funders about what we're doing well and what we need to grow. So we really do value and honestly need your feedback. So um, please do let us know how we're doing. Um, so feedback is honestly all looked at and very much appreciated. Hopefully it's easy to do. We try to make that as smooth as possible. And uh, so any feedback that you can give us is really very, very welcome. So thank you for that. A couple of things we just want to announce in terms of conferencing. We mentioned this the last two times, but just bring to your attention October 14th, a focus on cognitive remediation here in British Columbia. So please do keep that date in mind. It's, it promises to be a really um, groundbreaking conference in the city looking at cognitive remediation as a way forward. And um, Dr. Higginbottom and myself and others had a conversation with the Ministry of Health last week, and they were just uh, really speaking to the value of cognitive remediation. So it seems that it is a um, an intervention, for want of a better word, that I seem to have, it's, it's the time is right. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more, uh, please do come to the conference. Please save the date. Uh, you'll also know about the conference September 21 and 22 in Halifax, uh, the National Psychosocial Rehabilitation Conference. If you're interested in that, please do visit the PSY, um, uh, the PSR Canada website for more details. Again, that's two days in September. Promises to be a really good conference. Some big names, Drake et al., uh, who speak about um, uh, mental health, recovery, um, uh, employment. So lots of great topics in that in that conference. So please uh, check that out on the um, PSR Canada website. Uh, and finally, we in November we have the great pleasure of hosting uh, Ron Unger, uh, social work background, uh, two day session. So please stay tuned for that. We hope we uh, hope to see you there. Um, um, not an expensive conference is what I'm trying to say, uh, but hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see you there. So that promises to be really good as well. So with all that in mind, I'm going to once again just welcome our presenters and just move on to the content. Um, first of all, we have Jen, um, who has been a RAP Advanced Level um, uh, facilitator since 2007. Uh, she's brought her expertise to Fraser Health in 2002, and RAP has really grown exponentially in Western Canada. And currently she runs her own business called Luminate Wellness. One of the goals is to support uh, the growth of RAP in Canada, as well as bring conversations about
about mental wellness to workplace. So big warm welcome to Jen today, who I know has been battling traffic and has done uh, really well. So thanks very much for being with us to Jen uh, remotely today. Thank you kindly. And also we have Amanda Berg, who is hoping to join us uh, on the webinar this morning. Amanda, you've met before in this series. She's a RAP facilitator, uh, was on the original team, brought to RAP to BC and now working with RAP for about uh, 15 years and she oversees the RAP program at Vancouver Coastal Health. And Sylvia here is in the room with us. She's just been a star. She's been amazing. She's been, this is our third session with us and uh, poor Sylvia, we've really uh, popped her in at the deep level. Poor little thing. But anyway, she's doing really good. She's been a RAP facilitator since 2016. So this is a pretty new adventure for her and she's uh, just swimming flourishing with it currently in peer support training and believes strongly in the peer support model she's trauma informed yoga teacher and will be starting the douglas college um, training in the fall so we welcome her to the program and we are very grateful for her expertise uh, with us this morning and so with that i am going to uh, start the webcam and shuffle around and i'm just going to uh, hand you over Firstly, to Sylvia, who's nodding her head beautifully here. So I'm just going to start the sharing camera. Hello for me. And then over to Sylvia. So thank you, Regina. And thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us today for part three of Wrapping the Wrap. Um, for those of you who didn't have a chance to join us the previous weeks, what we're going to do is we're actually going to start off by doing a recap of where what we've covered so far so that those of you who know um, can join us and uh, see where we picked up. So uh, the RAP program is based on the five concepts of wellness. And the five concepts of wellness are hope, basically um, what something that gives you a sense of hope even in the time of darkness. Um, what motivates you to get out of bed in the morning? Um, for me, when I think about hope, I think about the fact that in my darkest time, I, I had a nephew who at that time was just a baby and you know despite the fact that I was in um, a really dark period in my life I could see this this baby this child that was full of life and um, I knew that there was still some brightness in the world so me that was my sense of hope and of course it looks different for everyone um, but it's really important to get started to, I see hope is kind of that light that leads you to the doorway. Um, personal responsibility, basically you're in the driver's seat of your life um, and it's really about taking, um, giving up the blame game. You know, we can be sad that there are circumstances that have worked against us, but realizing that in order for things to move forward, you you need to be in the driver's seat and you, you need to change your response to life events. Um, so, um, you know, in order, in, in we look at RAP and the peer support model, most people, um, you, know, you have to take the personal responsibility to go to a RAP group. You have to take the personal responsibility to go to your, to go to your case manager, to go to your doctor. You, um, you know, ultimately, you are in the driver's seat of your life. So another important part is education. So learning everything about yourself um, and learning perhaps if you know if you are struggling with your mental health you're struggling um, with your wellness and stress like learning about what it is um, that's you know causing these things um, what are the things that you can do to get better what are um, you know in, that could be a wrap program that could be learning everything about your medication learning you know if maybe you're involved in a cpt program learn you know not just taking uh, a doctor or a counselor's uh, word verbatim, but actually going out and finding out everything you can about it to see if it's really sufficient, the right thing for you. Um, for me, for education has, um, you know, that's why I became a RAP facilitator. Facilitator. That's why I'm in, engaged in the peer support program. That's why I'm engaged in the psychosocial rehabilitation. I mean, ultimately, um, I'm looking to share these models with other people, but it's it's really rooted in understanding myself better. Um, self advocacy. So nobody is going to uh, nobody is going to be an advocate for you better than you're going to be an advocate for you. Um, you may have a case manager, you may have a doctor, you may have friends and family who 
of, of hope, we would hope are good supports for you. But the strongest advocate for anybody is going to be yourself. Um, you know, for me, I, I think about that in the sense of um, I'm a, I have a vegan diet. Um, that's something that I've found works for me and supports my wellness and some of my own values and beliefs. Um, if I go out to a social environment, if I go to a dinner, and this happens often with me, um, that I can't expect other people to accommodate my dietary lifestyle. I have to either let them know, here is what I can and cannot, um, you know, uh, consume, or I have to take this self-advocacy and, and personal responsibility and bring something to the event that will suit my dietary um, limitations or my dietary lifestyle. Um, it's up to me to let other people know what is going on with me so that they can work with me. Um, same with, um, yeah, same with any somebody who has diabetes or somebody who has a heart condition. You need to let people know so that they can work with you and so that they're aware of any limitations that you may have. Not, I don't like the word limitations, but uh, just, oh, we want to work. Just so that they know how to how to work in in, in transition with you. Um, yeah, and it's also about really rooted in knowing our rights and making sure they're respected. So in the first session, we talked about the personal bill of rights. Um, we don't have time to go through them all today, but I do uh, invite you to go back to our PowerPoint from session one or webinar um, and review that again and remember that. Um, we all have a personal right, bill of right to say no, to, to, you know, to change our mind, to, to ask for something else. And being a self-advocate is, is basically engaging our personal bill rights and knowing that we're allowed, giving ourselves permission. It's really important to give ourselves permission when we go out in the world um, in terms of how we interact with it. Um, and lastly, support. So support is um, a really big one um, for all of us. Uh, um, you know, it's about having community. It's about having connection. It's about uh, finding people who are able to support you in your journey. We live in a time that's kind of this really disconnected time. People are, you know, if you go on the SkyTrain, if you go, um, Anywhere, you're, most people are connected with their mobile devices more than they are engaging with other people. So it's taking that time to step beyond that. Um, you know, talking to the cashier at the grocery store, talking to the librarian at, at, at your library, talking to people on the bus. Um, and also, you know, developing, ideally you want to have four or five really strong supports that can help you sh in the times that you are maybe not feeling your best, so that you have somebody, um, whether it's a family member, whether it's a friend, whether it's a neighbor, somebody you can call about to help you, um, you know, perhaps if you are going through a difficult time, somebody who can step up and maybe help you with your, you know, meal support or childcare or, um, you know, for a lot of us, if we have a spouse or a partner, that's somebody who's going to be a stronger emotional support or perhaps give you that time to take a space where you can, um, you know, for me, um, I have a really great support in my partner. And, you know, when I said that I needed this before I used to work full time and I said that that wasn't working, that wasn't supporting myself. And he said, okay, so you work part time and I'll just, I'll support us both. And, you know, not everyone has that, but you can find supports in other ways. Um, so how do we, how do we, continue to build community in our lives. Um, you know, for me, one of the things that I've really embraced about peer support is I'm able to make community connections with other people who have lived experiences similar to me and to know that I'm not alone. Um, so that's one of the things that I've really um, held on to with peer support. If that, Feel free to type your answers in the chat and we can talk about ways that you've been able to develop uh, support and community in your lives.
I guess for some of us, it's just it's often having having friendships around, having people that you can chat with. Um, yeah, having those and kinds that, of I mean, supports. sometimes the support, that's a, like a really strong emotional support. They mm -hmm. might not be able to make a meal or do groceries or whatever, but they're giving you emotional support. Right. I have, a, right. I have a, I have a, I have a, I don't have any kids, but I have a small dog and it's the same thing. Yeah. He, he provides me a lot of emotional support. Yeah. yeah. And so some people say I join organizations uh, like my church, 12 step uh, programs, groups, group clubs. Um, other person says they have an amazing uh, support person in their lives, um, partner, uh, much like you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Friends and family, yes. Right. A couple of, yes. A couple of mothers uh, whose young adults have challenges as well. That's super helpful. Yeah, yeah I think it, I think that's kind of like the idea of peer support. Like any group where you can talk to people who are going through similar um, right. similar situations, mm -hmm. it's really nice to know that you're not alone. And I think that's a really good source of support and community for right. sure. Yeah. All right. Um, I've got Carmen and CC still writing, um, so we'll see what what they want to add to the conversation. And then, yep, leisure activities, go painting nights. That's great. I've always wanted to do that, and I haven't done that. Meet people. Yep. I love. I mean, we're right now um, Douglas College is in New West. That's where we're doing this from, and I actually live in New West. And they have a lot of community events tonight. They're having. Um, they've just redeveloped the Front Street. Um, area right by the new Westminster Pier, if any of you know this area. Um, and they, so I guess Friday night, every night in the summer, they're having like this open house on Front Street. They have um, Thursday nights, they're having music down by the river. They have a lot of events and uh, Friday nights, they have movies in Queens Park. And I really love, you know, living in a, in a smaller, very community oriented right. city. And yes. I really, you know, if, I think that's one of the great things. I've lived in a big city. Um, I've lived in Toronto for many years, 14, 15 years. And now that I love live back in a small city, I, I notice that I feel more connected to, to people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think there's another comment down there that really resonates with me as well. The warm summer weather helps a lot. I spend yeah. time outdoors and refreshing. I so yeah, I so yeah. Cool with that. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, vitamin D is very uh, supportive. Definitely. Um, I know this past winter. I'm sure many of you would agree uh, with the amount of sun, or sorry, amount of lack of sun and the amount mm. of rain and and snow that we had. I definitely saw a big shift in, in, in where I was feeling and how I was, um, where m my mood was. And as soon as, as soon as the cyan came back out, I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's why I haven't been feeling like myself. <laughs> you know, um, it's just, it makes such a difference. So I know a lot of people um, who, who struggle with their mood or mental health, they get those lights light lamps is that what they're called light yeah. lamps um i've never actually got one myself but uh okay um so i think in the in the efficiency of time we're, we're i'm sure there's lots of more other ways that we can talk about support and other things that as they relate to the key concepts but just in the uh interest of time we're just going to move on to recap the rest of the uh wrap that we covered in the previous weeks so we are going to talk about wellness tools and some of you have already talked about it um, in terms of you know all of those things like whether it's going outside or nature bathing or hanging out with family friends those are all wellness tools basically wellness tools are anything that makes you feel good makes you things that you look forward to things that you know if you didn't have to um you know go to some of you may enjoy your job, but you didn't have to go to work or you didn't, you know, didn't have to do chores around the house. The things that you look forward to and the things that make at the end of it, you're like, oh, I feel good. Um, and some of those things might even be work. Like I always, um, I like washing the dishes. I actually <laughs> find it really meditative. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like, uh, you know, at the end of it, I feel like, oh, I have accomplished something. But things that you look forward to, things that, so, um, Maybe if you guys could suggest a couple wellness tools. I know for me, I mentioned my dog. Um, I, I've 
I know that Regina mentioned in my introduction that I'm a yoga teacher, so I, obviously I have a connection with yoga. Um, I love hanging out um, just in, in, there's so many free events in the city, and I really like going to free events because there are, there's so many variety of things you can do, whether it's music, whether it's movies, whether it's a community art gallery show, and you get to be around people. And I find for me, just sometimes even if I don't know everyone, just having people around me helps me remove that so social isolation that we feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I love that yeah. idea about nature bathing. Yes. And that, that's a new term for me. I think that's really yeah. very fun. Pink yeah. lipstick. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you for sharing that, Lauren. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm sure I could spend the whole webinar just talking about what wow was tools because that's my favorite thing. But again, we're going to um, go forward for this daily make of time, and we can. Yeah. So, so this is when we're getting into the nitty gritty of the wrap uh, wellness recovery action plan. So the daily maintenance plan has three components. The first is what I'm like when I'm well. So basically, um, in order to have a guiding point of what you like, what you um, um, what you are like when you are well. It's really quite <laughs> quite self-explanatory. But anyway, when you're not well, it's nice for particularly for uh, your supports and any uh, practitioners you might be working with in your in your journey to know what your kind of your 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 starting point is or your baseline is. So, um, and this is something that you should do when you're when you're talk when we talk about doing the wrap. I should uh, mention. Um, that we do this when we're well. Mm -hmm. You don't want to put together a, a wrap when you're not feeling well because um, the idea is that you're always trying to get back to the state of uh, your best well self. So part what? What am I like when I'm well? And I should mention um, some of the things that everyone's well is different and things that might be, like for me, I'm quiet when I'm not well. but for my partner, he's quiet all the time. He's like that when I'm well. So it's good to write that down because some people might see him as quiet and say, oh, he's not well. No, he's an introverted person. So he's he's always going to be, he's going to, his his um, trait that is him not well, is me, is, or him well is me not well, if that makes any sense. Um, so daily action plan um, are things you want to do every day. Um, and I, I keep these very simple, and I've only got five on my list. Um, and this may change as you evolve, because the wrap is kind of a living organic document. But you want to start with really simple, achievable things. So, um, you know, you don't want to put, perhaps, for most people, you wouldn't want to put run 20K every day. But you could put go for a short run around the block. Something that's achievable, particularly when you're starting out with your wrap. Um, my examples of mine are leave my apartment every day, move my body every day. And I, I kind of keep it general because whether I move my body for yoga or go for a walk, at least I know right. and I can acknowledge, oh, I've done something right. to move my body. Accomplished. Yes. Right. Um, so you want to keep that simple. Just have a couple, and you, and you might change that as you move forward. So part three are your optional, and those are the ones that you're not going to do every day. Uh, they are wellness tools, but you're only going to do them as needed. Um, for example, a really good one for me is uh, doing laundry. You don't want to do laundry every day. All right, that's going to cause you unnecessary stress. <laughs> but um, if you don't do laundry at all, that could also um, contribute to you being unwell. Right? So it's something you need to do regularly um, to keep your wellness, to have clean clothes and probably a clean house, but you only do it as needed. Same with paying bills. Okay. So now we're moving into triggers. So um, identifying triggers. Um, so starting to know what are the things that contribute to um, you not being well. For example, um, for me, one is um, really loud talking and yelling mm -hmm. or even loud noises can be something that's really triggering for me um so 
And, and there's a list of them. And, you know, when you start out your wrap, you're, you'll, it might take you a while to list them all. And again, it's an organic document. So, and having an action plan. So I go on the, I, I, I travel by transit. There's a lot of times, but there's a lot of noise on transit. There's a lot of people yeah. and a lot of people, sometimes they play their stereos. I don't know. Um, so I have to do an action plan and take responsibility for myself of what can I do. Sometimes that means having earplugs and listening to my iPod. Sometimes that means, okay, you know what? I'm going to take, get off at the next stop and then get on the next bus. Um, or sometimes that means, you know what? I'm going to take a deep breathing exercise. But knowing that with each thing that triggers you, having some type of plan that you can uh, do hopefully immediately. But um, there are going to be cases where, for example, um, that you might have to do something later that day. But knowing that you have something that will help you mitigate the stress and the feeling that you get when you have a trigger. Okay. So I think at this point we're going to trans transition over to Jen. Um, big thanks for your really how you brought yourself into that and really made it come alive for us you've used Thank your own you. personal examples and i know that's not often easy to do but uh thanks so much you're welcome i uh, really appreciate it with that, we're just going to hand it over okay, to Jen. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sylvia. And um, I'm going to finish up the, the rest of the, the overview. So um, we talked about daily maintenance. So daily maintenance is, um, you know, planning your day, basically. And then triggers. Trig triggers are external events that can cause us to go off balance. And we want to identify what they are and create an action plan to deal with it. So then... Sometimes we do the best that we can and we still find ourselves in a place where we're experiencing early warning signs. And early warning signs are subtle internal signs that things are not, not so great. So, you know, it could be something like um, not sleeping very well for a day or two. We usually recommend um, that people figure out, you know, a time frame for them. So So like for you, maybe not sleeping one night is an early warning sign, but then if it moves into like three or four nights, it could be when things are breaking down. This is the next part. So you want to figure out, pay, it's about paying attention to what's going on within my body, within what's going on uh, within my thoughts. It's, it's about awareness, early warning signs. So we want to identify what they are for us and then create an action plan. So that's, that's that piece. And sometimes we've done the best that we can with everything and we still find ourselves in a really bad place. So then that is when things are breaking down. So when things are breaking down are, is a more serious place. It's, it's not a crisis, but it, um, it's on the edge of a crisis. I, I describe it as like, you, you know, you feel like you're about to fall. You, you're not, you haven't fallen yet, but you feel like, oh, I'm, I've, I'm losing my balance. And if I don't, get things, um, get myself, you know, some, some support right now, I'm going to fall. So we want to identify what that looks like for us. And, and again, having a time frame around it can be really helpful because um, then, then it's, you know, when we're starting to not do so well, we, we kind of lose a bit of that cognition that we can realize that we're not doing well. So, so putting those time frames around it are really helpful for people, for us. Um, and then we want to create an action plan. And the action plan for when things are breaking down is more specific and we have less options. So for early warning signs, you might, you might say, I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to do all these fun things. And that's going to calm me down. When things are breaking down, it's more serious. So if you have 20 things, if we have 20 things on our list, that is overwhelming. So we want to pick the things that, are, that will give us the best results and the simplest way to, to choose them. So we might only have three, we might have four, something like that, but they, we, we're gonna choose the things that give us um, the best results. So it might be you know, taking time off work, it might be seeing uh, a support person, it might be those types of things. So that's all of what we've done so far. And today, what um, the plan is for today is to go through the
nine parts of the crisis plan. And the crisis plan is, it's, it's long and um, it's nice to have a little bit more time because we tend to rush it because um, because the rest of RAP, it takes so long, but the crisis plan is also really important. So we want to have enough time to uh, talk about all nine parts. And then the last part is post-crisis plan. And that is what do you do after a crisis? And how do we get back on our feet? I noticed you can see my funky picture in the back that's uh, Star Wars. It's my little wellness tool as I love Star Wars. Anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, so that's what we're going to do. I want to um, give some time at the end to answer questions about any of the content, any of the application of RAP, anything like that. So think about your questions and we'll, we'll try to have at least, you know, 15 minutes or so at the end to talk about that. For this part, again, like we talked about the other two times, it would be so great for you to think about this for yourself. So how, how does this apply to you and your own life? Because like we talked about in the other two sessions, that really this is about um, a living document. It's about us using a wrap if we're going to share it with the people we support. So. So the first step is always creating our own wrap. And um, yeah, so for this part, I'd like you to think about how this can apply to you. Um, crisis plan, obviously a little bit of the history. So, so wrap came out of the consumer survivor movement and it was created by a group of, of peers. Um, and then actually it's maybe, I think I will tell you the story because it's such a great story. So Mary Ellen Copeland, most of us, know who she is. Um, she uh, was not doing well. She was struggling and um, was living in a group home and she was really struggling to, to get better and she had some trouble with her medication. She wasn't able to take a certain medication because she had a toxic reaction. So she went to her psychiatrist and said, "How? what can I do? What can I do besides medication to keep myself well? And this was um, in the 80s, so 70s, 80s. So it was before a lot of the recovery work um, that we know now in PSR and in the recovery movement. So there wasn't a whole lot out there, to be honest. So the doctor couldn't really help her. So she said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do this myself. And someday I'm going to write a book. And she's uh, always glad to, to share that, you know, she said to her psychiatrist that she would write a book. And he thought she was being grandiose. And she's very pleased to, to say that, that her doctor has never written a book and she's written like 20, I think, a lot of books. <laughs> so what she did is she um, worked with a vo vocational counselor and created a survey. And this was before SurveyMonkey, it was before email, it was before anything. So she created a survey on a piece of paper and mailed it out to people who were struggling with their mental health issues. Um, and she wanted to basically research what do people do to stay well besides medication. Like medication is an option, but what else besides medication? So she got 125 back and basically like she was still not in a great spot. So she put them all in a Rubbermaid container and shoved it under her desk. And over time, she, um, you know, would take them out and read them and look at them. And what she realized is there was themes throughout people's surveys. Like people had written like pages, pages, pages. So she dissected it down to themes. And those themes are what we now know as the key concepts. So hope, personal responsibility, self-advocacy. Uh, self oh, education, I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> Pierce. <laughs> oh, I need to breathe. I've had a really stressful morning. But anyway, I'll tell you about that a little bit. But. Um, anyway, so hope, personal responsibility, education, self-advocacy, and support. So those are the key concepts that, and that came out of that research. So then she started doing uh, workshops, and she did this one workshop in Vermont. She's from Vermont, so Brattleboro, Vermont. And it was middle of winter, and about 20 people gathered um, to do this, uh, this workshop, and she was presenting them with this information. 
And the group said, well, this is great, but it's a lot of theory. How do we actually put it into place? How do we actually create something that's easy and simple to follow? So that group of, of 20 people were the people that actually developed the bones of RAP. So they went through Wellness Toolbox all the way to Crisis Plan, and then Post Crisis Plan was added later. So those people really created what we know now as RAP. And I think I find that so encouraging, that whole story, because it's all about hope. It's all about how we can each impact, we can each have an impact on um, people's recovery and the culture and the world. And it, so it's very, very, uh, very exciting. So anyway, so th that's a little bit of the history. So Crisis Plan started, like it definitely came out of the mental health movement. So it's written very much for a mental health crisis, although we can definitely use it for anything. So now RAP is used for any kind of struggle, whether it's a health struggle, whether it's, um, you know, wanting to quit smoking, whether it's um, an addiction or, you know, for people use it for diabetes, anything. So when you go through the crisis plan, think about it for you. What does a crisis look like for you? You may not end up in the hospital for a mental health issue, but you may end up for, in a hospital for a physical health issue or something like that. So, so think about it that way. Um, and then post-crisis plan we will cover as well. So um, the next section of RAP is crisis plan. In spite of your best planning and assertive action, you may find yourself in a crisis situation where others need to take over responsibility for your care. You may feel as though you're totally out of control. So we'll pretend that you have a book in front of you. So. Um, in, in your book, you can, or at the top of your page, you can write crisis plan, and it has nine parts. And one thing I just wanted to clarify from what um, Sylvia said is, is crisis plan, we encourage people to not do the crisis plan when they're not well. So it's not a good time to develop your crisis plan when you are unwell. But you can work on your wrap at any point. So lots of people um, do the wrap in, in uh, acute hospital settings um, that people have done it in lots of different places. So you don't have to be well when you do the rest of your wrap, but you do need to be well when you create your crisis plan because if you're in the middle of a crisis, it doesn't make sense to create a plan at that point. So the first part of crisis planning is what am I like when I'm feeling well? And this this is different than uh, part one of daily maintenance. You'll remember that this question, or this is in part one of daily maintenance. And it's in, in daily maintenance to be a source of hope for, for us. So it's a way of going, you know, sometimes I'm really cranky and sometimes I get really grumpy when I'm not well and I'm antisocial, but really, I really am a social person and I really am funny. So that's why it's in, um, in daily maintenance. It's in crisis planning because we share our crisis plan with people, our supporters. We share it with people who are supporting us who might not know us. So the reason it's in, in here is that it's a reference point for people who may not have met us. Um, some people put photographs. Some people I'm like when I'm feeling well is you can have photos. You can have like little, uh, you can write some things, um, paragraphs to describe yourself when you're well. Um, I'm quickly, we're running out of time, but I wanted to uh, mention that for me, when I uh, was having my um, second baby, my first uh, birth was very difficult and it was, a, it was, it was really hard and uh, the birth itself was hard, healing after was really hard, almost to the point that I didn't want to have any more kids. Um, and six years later, we decided to have another one, and it was a little bit scary for me because I had also experienced some postpartum uh, depression and things like that. So it was it was hard. I, I was like, oh no, I don't know if I want to do this. So an example of using a crisis plan is I actually used the format of a crisis plan and created a birth plan with it. So for this part, when I did what I'm like when I'm well, I actually took that section to just write a big long list of my history and what didn't work last time and how what I did want 
um, for the next time. And I'll tell you more about that, but it changed everything for me, having that plan in place, like it changed, it changed everything. Okay, so part two is signs that supporters need to take over. So list all those signs that indicate to others that they need to take responsibility for your care and make decisions on your behalf. So this, need, this we also call this part indicators. So it needs to be really clear to people when they need to step up. So we can't have things like when I have uh, rapid thoughts because people can't, um, can't hear, hear that. So it needs to be something that others can see that go, okay, something's not right. I need to support, I need to step in and provide some support. So it could be things like, you know, not leaving the house for a certain number of days or um, not showing up for work or, um, you know, all, all that kind of thing. Um, and then that tells people to step in. So then part three is supporters. So list at least five people you want to take over for you. You can include family members, friends, or care providers. Ask the people you choose if it's okay for you to include them on the list and tell them what you want to do to be involved. Show them a copy of your plan. So the reason we suggest five people is that, um, you know, somebody might be away or someone else might not be able to uh, be there for us. Whereas if we have five people, then our chances are higher that someone will be able to support us um, at the time that we need it. Also, if we just have one or two people, um, we can really max, max out someone's support. So it's really good to even that out. Um, and then again, we want people to sign off that it's, it's okay that they're, they're on board. I'm going to proceed from here. Um, so just give us one second to, to fire up here no, from here. Um, yeah. okay. so we're just going to get into place. There you go. Hey everyone. Okay. So continuing on from Jennifer, she was, I believe she was talking about um, part five of crisis planning, which is treatments. So basically, you just want to list all the treatments you would like and treatments you want to avoid. So whether um, um, and and this includes alternative. Um, so any medications that um, you've had a, um, a bad reaction to, you want want to make sure you list those and. Um, any treatments that you want to avoid, you want to list those. But at the same time, any things that really have worked for you, you want to make sure that you list those as well. So it's um, that's that's part five, which is the treatments. Just making sure you have a clear list of what things you're open, you would like, and what things you don't like. So I think we can move on to part six. Um, so. Um, Kind of continuing on from um, treatments, we're looking, going to look at kind of treatment centers, whether it's home, that can be your treatment center, it could be a community care center, or it could be a uh, respite center. Um, for some people, um, this might involve hospitalization, but hospitalization is not the best option for everyone. Some people um, actually don't move forward in their recovery when they are hospitalized, so they would rather stay um, in another facility or for some people they have a very clear uh, list of facilities that they are open to and which ones they're not for me, um, I'll tell you, my sister is a doctor at a local facility, hospital, so I don't want to, that would be on my list of places I don't want to go because for me, there's just too little bit, too much entanglement in there. Um, or, you know, if there's a place that you have found that they have really, you know, really um, great, I don't want to say service, but care. really care, um, and other places that you might didn't have a good experience, you would want to list those. Um, if for you want to make sure you also know all the resources that are in your community, particularly if you're new to a community, um, and find out which places um, might might be best suited to you or ones that you want to avoid. So just having a very clear plan about that. 
So next we're going to go on to <laughs> treat. Oh, I, I already covered that. <laughs> okay, so part six, uh, sorry. Um, it's okay. Yeah, so part six and seven actually kind of work together. Yeah, right. uh, it's To me, they're very much the same. It's all treatment facilities. Um, some, you know, some of them could be uh, community care, respite centers, others um, uh, would be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. So just having to clear which ones you uh, want and which ones you'd like to avoid. Which ones are helpful. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, I think we can move on to part eight, help from others. So this is really where um, um, having a clear list of supporters helps is you want to have a list of who are your supporters and what things you would like them to do. And the reason, um, you know, Jen had already mentioned that you wanted to ha ideally have around five in case some people mm -hmm. might not always be available at the time that you need them to step up. But it's also, the way I also look at it is that different people in your life can uh, support you in different ways. For example, um, you might have somebody who's a supporter who doesn't feel comfortable going into a hospital or a uh, healthcare facility, but they might be able to come to your house and water your plants and feed mm -hmm. your animal while you're while you're taking care of yourself. Um, you might have somebody who um, is really good with cooking you meals, or somebody else who enjoys taking you to your appointment. So everybody can support you, but we can't all support people in the same way. So knowing who would be able to support you in which way and letting them know which way they like them to support and making sure that that aligns with what they're able to support you with. Okay? I think we can go to section nine. When oh, my all these technical things that have failed me today. So <laughs> talk about triggers. So yeah. So thank you. I missed what you had covered. So did you finish part uh, nine? I, I finished it. I I yeah. I don't know if you want to if add. I don't know if you heard me. If I if there's anything, you, yeah, you probably didn't. Okay. Um, so yeah, I just basically mentioned that just like you for you want to have a list of indicators when you're well, so or when you're not well, so people know that they need to activate the crisis plan. You want to have a clear list. So, um, for example, if uh, if you left your house for three days, then people can step back. Super. This is such a great example of co-facilitation, that's all I have to say, and I know that that's one of the key values of wellness recovery action planning, so I just want to celebrate. Uh... You know, and this is a great opportunity to mention that, why we do that, is like sometimes uh, we always, the, the model, the facilitation model of the Copeland Center is to always have two facilitators and that's because like exactly this like I like today my battery was dead and it was like a complicated thing to get it started before I left and then there was a massive accident on the freeway so I had to like actually turn around and come back home because I was going to be at Douglas and then you know there was many things and now my computer needed to be restarted all this technical stuff so it's so great that sylvia is here so i wasn't all on my own without that it would have been a big ball of chaos so that's one of the um ways that we really model this is that we always co-facilitate because it's um, it really adds to what we do because we all have bad days we all have things that happen that can prevent us from being our best. So, so this is a great example. Thank you. Um, and somebody asked if we could go redo part four. So I can quickly go over that because I think my mic was cutting out. So part four is, I don't, I don't know how much you heard. Basically, it's a list of all the medications that you use, um, insurance companies, ID, all that kind of thing. If you also use, um, uh, vitamins and things like that, that would be in the medication section as well. And things that you would uh, would prefer to use if you needed. So what would you choose and what is, what is not okay and why? Why don't you want to use it? And it's always important to, to list why. And I gave an example for me that in my birth 
plan. This was all about interventions that I was okay with and things that I wasn't okay with um, during my labor. And it was it was so great to have that. Um, I gave I gave a copy of it to my doctor. I gave it to the nurses on staff, and then as well, my husband was aware of what was in there. So, and I received such good support because of uh, you know getting that uh, having that ready and distributing it. Um, okay, so now we're back at part nine. I think we finished part nine enough. Basically, it's just a list of indicators that. Um, let us know that, that, that let our supporters know that they can back off so that we don't keep having all this support when we don't need it. It's really important to tell them, okay, it's okay, you can step away now and, and I'm doing okay on my own. Um, so that's the end of crisis plan. And it's again, we want to update it. We want to give copies to people. We want to make sure that people who are our strong supporters are aware of what's in there. Um, lots of people actually use RAP for families as well. So people can have a family crisis plan. People can um, use it uh, for, for lots of different things. So it could be for different types of health issues. So then the post-crisis plan, we tend to break up into two sections. So this is the time after crisis. And the, and the time after a crisis, we're really tender. You know, it's really... Um, a, a time that we need to take really, I mean, it's good to take care of ourselves anytime, but especially after a crisis, we need to kind of ease our way back into regular life. So it's really important to, to you can do some of the post-crisis planning prior, um, but it's also good to, to work through it right after a crisis. Um, for example, for me, the post-crisis part was about with my birth story was like I was very clear I didn't want any visitors after um, in the hospital for the whole time I was in the hospital because it was such a hard time last the time before that I said I don't want any visitors so that was part of my my plan and then I I had my mom help me with cooking and things like that so that was part of my post-crisis planning um, but definitely people have different things and they want different things in, um, as they lead back into regular life. Um, so we divide it into two parts and it's not listed here, unfortunately, because post-crisis planning is big. There's a lot in there, but we break it into like issues that need addressing and then a timetable for resuming responsibilities. So around the issues, um, we look at people you need to thank, um, changes you want to make in your life as a result of what you've learned. One thing I haven't mentioned already is that the beauty of having a crisis plan is that people, it's like an advanced directive, and we know that people get back on their feet quicker when they have a crisis plan. So it helps people to really get back um, a lot quicker than without having one. So it's definitely um, makes a big difference. So what we encourage people to go back, like is there things you want to adjust in the rest of your wrap? Are there things that you've learned? Because it doesn't have to mean the end of the world. We we shift our mindset around crisis and realize it it doesn't mean that life is over. It's just a period of time that will pass and life will get back to normal again. And um, what do we need to take care of ourselves during that time while we get back on our feet? So what, what can we learn from it? What do we need to do to prevent further, further repercussions from this crisis? Do we have people we need to apologize to? Did things come up that maybe we don't like that we need to address? Um, do, are there people we need to make amends with? Is there medical, legal, or financial issues that need to be resolved? There's a, there's a lot, a, a big piece of that, and most of that gets worked through af after. You can't really plan that ahead of time. Um, and then the next part is a timetable for resuming responsibilities. And this is something that we can plan ahead a little bit. So if we're going back, if we have a full-time job, how are we going to get back um, to regular life, regular full-time hours? Are we going to do a return to work program? Are we going to have some extra support if we have children or if we have other responsibilities? Um, can we have some people step in and support us for that? 
and who who's gonna like help us with that or support us with that like do we have close friends and family that who will support us or that kind of thing so it's really a a, a detailed list of how life will get back to the, to the way it was prior to the crisis and having this we know really supports us to get back a lot quicker than just kind of flailing around because we know sometimes we can come out of crisis and not really um, have enough support and end up right back in crisis. So this will um, support people to to just keep on the trajectory of getting well. Um, so addressing the yeah will guide you through the process. So that's 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 it. So that's that's all of wrap. You got a chance to hear the whole thing. So um, any. So Janet, Regina, I guess we're just encouraging people to uh, write if they have any plans. questions. I know that you and I have often talked, Jen, about um, mm -hmm. as you roll this out. So sometimes it's kind of tempting to do that, but we acknowledge that this uh, material that each and every one of you have shared with us is because you've put in the hard work to be uh, trained and acknowledged facilitators. So I guess just adding that caveat might be helpful um, just to acknowledge that a lot of the work that we're using today is by permission and it's copyrighted. Um, there are other models for doing this kind of work like uh, uh, illness management plans and so forth from other organizations, but just do want to say that sometimes it's easy to go and run with parts of this information, but that it's really... A Thank you for mentioning that. I also um, wanted to mention a little bit about the study, the evidence-based study that was done a while back by Judith Cook. Um, but yeah, the, the, the thing with RAP is that it's really different than some of the other programs. You can, you can take pieces of it. Um, people have done that. People have taken pieces of it and tried to create their own thing. But it's really important to know that that isn't RAP. RAP is meant to be done in a certain way. And um, if someone there could type in, um, Find the link to the way RAP works. It's on the Copeland Center website and it's a pretty big document. I think it's a 20 page document about the fidelity of RAP and how, how organizations need to follow the fidelity of RAP to make sure it works properly. Um, I've heard of some pretty uh, not so great stories of people like taking bits of RAP and, and doing it without being trained and it it can actually be really detrimental to people. So it's important to receive the training. It's important to go about it the right way so that you can be on board with what the um, underlying bits are that we didn't talk about today. So we talked about the, the pieces and the sections and all that, but the things we didn't get to talk about are the values and ethics and all the foundational bits of RAP that really shape it into what, what it is, being a, a program that's grounded in um, self-determination, in um, hope, and all that kind of stuff. And it can be hard when we've worked within the system for a long time um, and we haven't um, taken the training. It can be hard to really grasp. Everyone, no matter who they are, needs to take the facilitator training to really grasp and get time to work with the values and ethics of RAP. Um, I actually could read them if we want to. Oh, there we go. There's uh, Regina listed the Remembering Kate article, and I believe that article is the way RAP works. So I encourage anyone who's thinking seriously about bringing RAP to your agency to really take And a Jen, look at I that think there's first. something about the way um, Dr. It's, Cook it's et al. Really had really looked at that, um, and, and I know you'll speak to it, but just in terms of the fidelity. And so this is one model, one approach that has a proven outcome, and it has that proven outcome because of its fidelity, I think. And as you mentioned, there are other approaches. I know some work we're doing in uh, lower and social um, income countries that it's, it draws from a lot of these ideas, but it is quite different. But we're offering this to you as a package because it has some proof. I think 2009 it started, but then... So the study happened, I, I don't remember the exact year, it was... Oh. 
Okay, and they they took um, one state, uh, I think it was Ohio, um, and they um, studied all the groups that happened within the RAP model, and they tracked the results of all those groups that happened within that period of time. Um, and they tracked, there's a pre-survey that we give out and a post-survey, and then they also gave one out at three months and six months. So that's how they uh, calculated the results of RAP, and they had a very strict um, agenda that they followed. Every single group had to follow the exact agenda. They were all trained facilitators, and they completed RAP in the same amount of time and with the same agenda. Um, and then they tracked the results over that period of time. So, so yeah, that's the, that's the study. I actually have, um, once I'm done speaking, I can uh, put the link to an article about with, that gives more details about the study. Um, but definitely RAP is evidence-based. It's evidence-based only if it fo follows the model that's in the way RAP works, which is um, people are trained, people have to have their own RAP first, um, live their RAP, become a facilitator, facilitate from a peer perspective. It doesn't mean you can't be a clinician or there's been doctors who've um, become RAP facilitators, but we still have to learn how to um, facilitate from a peer perspective, um, which means basically sharing about our own our own life and and not you know coming from up here and talking um, as an expert that we come at it from a level playing field that we're in this together and life is hard for all of us um, anyway so those are the ways that that are that make rap um, that hold up the fidelity of rap and it's really important that when we roll it out that we follow all those all those um, steps and I know because we did this and I know that it can be hard and it can be expensive at the beginning before like when we're first getting people trained it can be really challenging to follow the model but we also know that it really really works and I've seen it in in my life I've seen so many people's lives who've been transformed by RAP, it's like a life-changing program, more so than anything else I've I've seen within uh, my experience in mental health. So it's very powerful. Thank you, Lauren. I am going to read quickly the uh, values and ethics of RAP because I think it's really important to mention. Um, this is from a document uh, created by the Copeland Center. So this is. This is um, really, as facilitators, this is the foundation of everything we do within our uh, workshops. So each session supports the premise that there is hope that people can get well, stay well for long periods of time, and do the things they want to do with their life. Um, I'm going to read this quickly and then I'll answer Carmen's question. Um, number two, self-determination, personal responsibility, empowerment, and self-advocacy are all key aspects of the program. So the program supports decision-making decision and personal sharing. Par participants are treated as equals with dignity, compassion, mutual respect, and unconditional high regard. And there is unconditional acceptance of each person as they are, unique, special individuals, including acceptance of diversity with relation to culture, ethnicity, language, religion, race, gender, age, disability, se sexual orientation, and readiness issues, which that, we could talk about that for a while. <laughs> Lots of times people want to um, hold people back from doing RAP, but RAP is voluntary. We don't ever say that someone's ready or not ready. Um, it's up to people to choose. So this program is based on the premise that there are no limits to recovery. Um, they're given the opportunity to explore, choice, explore choices and options, not final answers. Um, we don't give final answers. Um, so people, yeah, and all, all, particip all participation is voluntary. It's understood that people, that each person is the expert on him or herself. The focus is on strengths and away from perceived def deficits. Clinical, medical, and diagnostic language is avoided. So 
so we don't get up we talk about how people feel versus diagnosis lots of people don't even talk about diagnoses in a rap group <clears throat> so the focus is peers working together and learning from each other in order to increase mutual understanding knowledge and promote wellness the program emphasizes strategies that are simple and safe for anyone and stays away from strategies that may be harmful and difficult feelings and behaviors are seen as normal responses to traumatic circumstances and in the context of what's happening and is not treated as symptoms or a diagnosis um, it's not what happening and not as symptoms or a diagnosis so just um, acknowledging difficult feelings versus always labeling it as part of, as a symptom um, and there's unconditional acceptance of all creative work and expression brought to each session so that's a, a little sample of the values and ethics and Carmen asks um, do you have an example of a family in crisis and how they would use RAP um, well, there's a number of different ways you could do a family wrap. There's actually a book on family wrap. So you could sit down with a family and go through the whole thing and, and look at it as a family. So um, what are the wellness tools as uh, for us as a family? So what things do we need to do together as a family? What are the, the what are our triggers? as a family so you work through it and do it as as a family as a whole kind of like uh, some people use this for teams as well but you do this for family um, or each person in the family can have their own wrap which is probably a good idea too um, so then if the family is in crisis how that how would they use wrap um, generally it would be um, what I have seen anyway is if there's one person in the family who's having a crisis um, then you know you start using the the crisis plan and it depends entirely on what people have um, put in their plan so they may have you know if something happens you know under support that the kids are gonna go stay at grandma's um, it could be different things like that so you would just it's exactly the same as you would use for an individual you would just change the way um, it would, you would just change the way you would approach it differently and you'd have different tools different experiences different things that you would add in there that would um, work for the family and I can't say we're talking hypotheticals but um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers Sorry, that was me. Uh, I apologize, Jen. That was me. I was just um, curious because I, so the, the way that you describe that is uh, it's inclusive of everybody in terms of a family approach. And, uh, you know, I guess there's other approaches that include family only without the person who might have a lived experience or the bother or whatever it might be. But it's curious that the way you described that sounded like it was a very inclusive um, approach to family intervention. It's just curious. Uh, I think the the thing that's so beautiful to me about RAP is you're looking at the bare bones of a structure. So you know you have the RAP structure, the RAP model, and you can fill it in however you want. So whatever the family um, needs and feels is important for them, they would put that in their family crisis plan. So again, it's one of those things that would, would be really helpful to do it with some support. So like having going through a workshop and having facilitators support people to figure out what needs to go on there. Um, but definitely there's flexibility. Like it's not something that's like this is the rule. This is the way you do it. It just works with whatever works for that family um, or that person or you know group of people. You can you can create a wrap for uh, for your like partner or like some teams do a wrap how to keep the team well you wouldn't do uh, when things are breaking down our crisis plan when you're doing it as a team because the team will have fallen apart <laughs> already any other questions that's okay maybe maybe we don't have any more questions that's that's just fine um you have our email you have jen's you have mine we, if you were one of those people who came through the new link that uh, Manny sent at the last moment, please do uh, let us know and uh, send us an email and we can send you an evaluation tool. 
Uh, we just we love to hear from you. We need to hear from you. Uh, please stay tuned over the summer. We are looking at uh, maybe doing some work with Fraser Health Authority and thinking about tertiary health and supporting tertiary health services. We're also looking at the fall and thinking about uh, hopefully hearing from some great work from Open Door Group and others. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll be in touch. Um, sounds like we're closing down for the day. I just want to say a big thank you to people, uh, to you for being here with us today and also to our presenters because uh, that was a very creative uh, last um, problem solving in the moment uh, approach today. So thanks so much, uh, Jen, really uh, commend you for your professionalism in the middle of a car crash and everything else that went on. So thanks very much and to our speakers in the room. Uh, uh, if I can turn the camera on again one last time, I will. Uh, I'm just gonna, maybe I can't. I'm just gonna start <laughs> this. I'm not sure why we only have one camera. But we do. Um, but anyway, to, to just, um, I don't think we had a wee shot of Manny, but just to say thanks to Manny, uh, who's with us today. Thanks kindly, Manny. <laughs> Sylvie, bless your little heart, because without you today, we wouldn't have been able to do such a wonderful, well, high quality <laughs> presentation. So thanks. Thanks Thank to you, everybody everyone. online. Thanks very much. Uh, Michael adds, thanks, a great uh, illustration of teamwork and collaboration. Big thank you to you. <coughs> that's so kind. Uh, so anyway, from us, I think that's us. We're going to take a little break for a couple of weeks. Happy summer to everybody. Um, let us know. Keep the feedback coming. 